This is the October 10th uh, meeting of the Fort River School Building Committee. Um, we are meeting in the Amherst Police Station uh, community room, and we're being taped for broadcast by Amherst Media. And I have a cold, so I'm going to do my best to enunciate <laughs> um, and not cough <laughs> too terribly much. Um, uh, first item on our, well, uh, minutes other than the call to order is uh, proving, proving previous minutes. Um, and I don't know if anyone had uh, corrections to the minutes that went around. Yes. A couple of questions. Yep. So um, under item five, it said uh, architects, uh, it said that site engineers have visited the building and that reports have been forwarded to the committee. Did, that one, did we actually? I think they went around, but they went around several weeks ago okay. now. That's so fine. Okay, let great. me know if you don't have it, and I can. I can. You know what? It's probably it. fine. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. I just thought that that hadn't happened yet, and then. Um, I don't think we have the architectural quite yet. We still owe you the architectural portion, but what we have done is the structural, the mechanical, Frank's new program, mechanical, um, and site. So those reports should be on your file. It should be yep. available. Yep. Yeah, pretty sure. yeah, it's also on the website. Too, yeah, right? they're posted on the website. Okay. <laughs> the other thing that we still don't have is the survey. We don't have the survey. So that, that wasn't from you guys, that was mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. I think that, our side. That, I think that's where my confusion is. Yeah. I knew we were waiting for some things. Right. So. Okay. The we have the geotech. It's a little out of order, but the geotech is, I, it's my understanding, is ready to go out. It's, the RFP has been finished. Yeah. Uh, a number of firms have been identified. Yeah. So uh, I had wanted to have it out before this meeting, but I, I didn't get it out. I will go out tomorrow morning. Uh, I have a list of six firms to solicit from various people. Uh, it's just a simple quote process, so we won't have a, a formal opening or anything like that. But we'll and Anthony, you don't, you don't know any more on the status of the survey. I don't. Uh, that, that communication has not been going through me um, at all. What I realized so, after the last thing, and I asked Jim about it because he, he didn't have <laughs> any information on it either, is I, I don't know who it would go to. Um, yeah, I don't, I, don't know if, I don't know if Berkshire is kind of, maybe they're just waiting for someone to talk to them. I, I, I'll, I'll reach out again, okay. because I have reached out before and not heard much, but I'll try again. Other comments, questions on the previous minutes? Someone want to move to a group? Okay. All in favor? Um, we are now at our public comment period. Anyone in the public want to make comment? Okay, so we're going to move on to uh, discussions with our consultants. Um, and we, we have two broad categories. One um, is a report on the existing uh, conditions and, and also to talk about uh, net zero design elements. Right. Um, and then I, I suspect we'll also talk a little bit about uh, progress on, on design. Yes, we will. Um, I know, Mike, at some point you would like to, to chime in. Do you, do you want to do that now, or should we do that after we hear the reports? Do you have a preference? I don't. Okay. Well, why, why don't we dig into the reports? Absolutely. Because I think that's the important piece to, to start to understand. Sure. So um, <coughs> first let me introduce two gentlemen here who have joined us this evening. Frank Duares, who's a professional engineer, <coughs> his specialty is mechanical engineering. Don't ask him why it's warm in here, uh, because he doesn't know. Um, I have theories. You have theories, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, Frank is with Colorona, the mechanical consultant that we brought in, and they have done an investigation of the existing conditions at the Fort River School, uh, and they're going to be participating in our discussion a little bit later about sustainability and net zero. Uh, the other gentleman is Chris Schaffner. He's the green engineer. Literally, that's the name of the firm, the green engineer. And he's been brought in. Uh, he was part of the team initially that uh, came to you and for interview. And uh, so he's an expert in net zero, has done such projects in the past, and he'll participate in that discussion as well. I have Peter Levy from my office. Uh, he's also here observing myself. Peter, I found out when he showed up this evening, um, is from this area. Your, your parents live in town. Used to, yeah. Or used I went, to live I went in to town. Crocker Farm. 
<laughs> My wife and your wife went to Fort River. Fort River. Got some, uh, local connection. Some, yeah, local connection. So anyway, so you have no comments about the project. You're just coming to visit your relatives, I'm sure. Exactly. Um, so that's who we are on this side of the table. Uh, new people, anyway. Um, we do owe you the report on architectural. We want to schedule another walkthrough. We'd like to come in through it with several people and focus on certain aspects of the existing building, like the walls, windows, you know, all of the skin of the building. Uh, and that, that should be done in the next week or so. So we need to schedule that with Jim. There are a few things that we are hoping to obtain um, that are still open. Um, the uncertainty of the floodplain. Um, and so we'll be discussing a number of, we'll be discussing a matrix of options that we're trying to flesh out and then we'll later talk about how many of those options we really need to focus on. We owe you a, a, a range of options, but when you look at the matrix, there's lots of possibilities. So we don't want to do 30 options, we want to select the ones that are most appropriate. So we'll have that discussion a little bit later. Um, <coughs> the floodplain um, does affect the options because depending upon whether the floodplain is located where it currently is shown automatically eliminates some possibilities like a new building in certain locations of the site just because of the extent of the floodplain. If the floodplain line is corrected and filed and accepted by the town then that presents other possibilities. So we may end up in one of the options looking under the existing floodplain scenario and under the new floodplain scenario. Okay. Because I don't know what the timetable is for accepting the new floodplain, but it could be months from now. Okay. So we may need to look at both. Just on that, we've only just hired uh, someone to actually do the floodplain revisions, but that was this week, so. But then to actually have them approved and filed by the town, that takes still some time, time off and it yeah. may happen after most of the rest of the work. The That's correct. Complete. That's why I'm saying that we okay. probably will need to look at two scenarios. Okay. I have a question. This is the revising the ones with the survey they did last year? The ones they have done over that they finished last year. That's a new standard that was issued. I get is my understanding. I only have a tertiary understanding of this. But there was a new standard that was released, and the survey methods previously weren't up to it. So this is to this is a small revision to bring it up to the modern standard. Apparently, I'm suspecting there was probably some change uh, at the federal level that this is reflecting. There was, uh, yeah, what happened is that there was a, a paper that came out that they wanted to use a different algorithm. There's no additional measurements that I, I understand that are required. Um, and when, from speaking with folks at, at the town, there's not an anticipation that there's going to be much difference from the revision that has already occurred. But um, it needs to be voted on. Um, it, the, the, this secondary work is being completed and then that has to be adopted. But do we have that draft? Yes, do, it's available. We, online. Okay, we do. Yes. All right. So we can continue with that draft and then showing those two options. I, I think and that's then if that approach. if that draft is adjusted in the future if it's minor, it's not going to affect probably the study. Um, we're still puzzled by the library size. We will need help trying to sort through that with this committee. Um, we're kind of baffled by the fact that the Crocker Farm library <coughs> square footage is smaller, and that yet the collection is. Do you recall what it is? It's it like thirty, thirty thousand. It's so like thirty-one thousand volumes. <coughs> There's the Fort River, if you recall, is around thirty-four thousand. It just doesn't make sense to us, and we don't understand it. It could be the thickness of a volume. But if it's the same age range, yeah, I think it would be similar. We need bigger books at Fort Worth. Well, I, I do say that the library does tend to be a very 
uh, communal place that's used for multi-purpose. Um, we hold our staff meetings there. We make use of the space. I understand. And yet the library at Crocker Farm is small. I understand that. I don't think they use it for the same purposes that we do. We hold our PGO coffees there. It's a gathering place. We encourage families to utilize it. It's somewhat of a community center of the school. I understand. Yeah, so I mean, having worked in both buildings, I'll just say that um, today, today in point, I mean, at Crocker Farm, other they have a community room that yeah. serves the function that some of the extra space at Fort River in the library uses. So everything that Diane said is true, and since, since there's not a community room at Fort River, sort of that function gets doubled up mm -hmm. for the library, which I do think accounts for significant some of the variation in the size that you're referencing. Um, so I think I think that you know if you combine the community room at Crocker Farm and the library and compared to the library at Fort River, I wonder what the metrics would be. I don't know off the top of my head. Does the community room in Crocker Farm get used for other purposes? Which uh, because we had the in the <coughs> blueprint that we have the other day, there was no room labeled community room as far as I remember. I could shed some light on this. There is no community room at Crocker anymore. It got taken over. Um, so it is now no longer a community. There was one room that was, I don't know, um, a mid-sized room, but it's, it's, it's not. It's been reprogrammed. It's, it's been repurposed. Yeah. Pre somebody took it over. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, as we develop the options, we're going we're gonna to make a recommendation, and then we'll leave the committee's input. Before we move on too far, if we can find a way to serve those additional functions, do you think there's a possibility that a smaller library space will work where you really believe that it really does it, it does need to do that double duty in that space? Um, well, I haven't experienced any difference, yeah. honestly, so it's hard to speak to if it will work or if it won't yeah. work. Um, I think there is a nice feel to it as it existing. I'm not saying yeah. it couldn't be somewhat smaller, but I think the significant reduction is, is a bit concerning. Um, uh, it's nice to have people come into our building and, and utilize the resource as a community space. Sure. Um, one of the items that you had asked last time is could we look at expanding northward for, at Fort River? We're going to be discussing that tonight as well. <coughs> and uh, another question had to do with the possibility of using the gym at Fort River and expanding it in its location because the roof is higher in that area. It's more complicated than that. Uh, we had our structural engineers looked at that and there are columns that support the mezzanine in that area. So we can't really just blow that space out without doing some significant structural modifications and getting into the seismic reinforcement requirements. So it's not as simple as one would think. Okay, we can discuss when you show the yes. And uh, we have on our calendar a meeting with the school committee, really just an informational session on the 27th. I just want to see if that's still. So yes, I got confirmation through Eric, even though he's not here tonight, that yep. that's on now on their calendar. Um, I think it's kind of a joint uh, meeting. And so at some point, heads will have to be put together about what, what the range of things we're going to talk about, because I'm sure they have their regular business that they're also going to be somewhat attend to that evening, yeah. um, but we'll work something out. Yeah, comment, I mean, what typically happens, it's not the only body that there's joint meetings yeah, recently. Another, you know, elected body, you know, or appointed body, and um, typically it's the first agenda item, out of respect for two groups coming together, so yeah. that in Amherst that would be a 6 o'clock meeting, um, or 6.05 after, you know, and the other you know, approving minutes, things like that. Um, and it, you know, I think you know, the agenda, what topics would cover is, is important, but um, we've done that before and, and we try to respect for everyone's time, not have it as a third agenda item where you may or may not get on at 7, 12, or you know, whatever it says on the schedule. Right. Um, so I think you can, you know, in my conversations with Mr. Dodas, the chair, you can thank on that being the, the first agenda item. Is that meeting at your building? It's at the high school library. At the high school library. Yeah, typically they're at the high school library, and I would imagine this would be the case, that would be the case as well. What, what date is that? Uh, I have November 27th. Yes. Yes. November, yes, November 27th, 2018. <coughs>
And would, and would be presenting or how how will it work? I don't yeah. know yet. <laughs> um, Eric uh, was going to do some follow up, um, and, uh, and I think he had to go out of town, and, and so I don't I don't think all the details have been worked out. But typically, typically what we have happen is the chair of this committee makes an introduction to the project, what uh, the project has, um, the, the things that have been talked about at this meeting, uh, the issues that have been identified, and it's really an opportunity for uh, members of the school committee to ask questions. So uh, we're not expecting decisions to occur that night, it's just a, a, an opportunity for everyone to get caught up. I think later maybe I can describe who's the, the feasibility of this building committee was on the agenda last night in our school committee and I can share some of their feedback, both on I think some initial thoughts about the November twenty seventh and some other thoughts they had at the appropriate juncture. I think it might be helpful. And the other thing, I w the last thing I want to bring up before uh, Jesse gets into going through this uh, PowerPoint presentation is communication that we received from Maria. I, I, I saw the email, presumably it's from you and not some joint body. Uh, body. I, I got some feedback from certain people that I, I okay. that told me a couple things. And then the, the second part where it was in painful detail about each of the... Okay. The sections that was me. It was a very long email. It was. It had a lot of good thinking in it. Uh, and Jesse did respond. We both looked at it and he responded to it. Um, for In order for us to maintain communication protocol, I, I don't know if you sent it back to all the members of the yeah. You did, which was the right thing to do. But I think in the future, if I could ask if people on the committee have questions or public have questions, they should be funneled, I think, to the chair. Yeah, I sent it to Jesse and to Jonathan. Yeah. Okay. And I know, I think it might be helpful, you. yeah, I think if it's got, if we're getting, because we're going to garner comments from the public, I think it would be good if we could share them to our group first, not that I want, I don't want to filter anything out, but so that everybody in our group hears the, the same thing, and then we can and move them on. It's, it's, it's more kind of just a I, housekeeping. The only thing is that we cannot comment. He's just right. sharing it, but you yeah. cannot right. comment and on it. It's receiving, by the way, I'm sending this. But it gives the opportunity that if someone sees something that right. they think we need to discuss as a committee before passing it on to say, I think we should hold this until we've had a chance to, to talk about it as, as a group. Correct. That, that's the point. Okay. So uh, that's all I had to discuss. Uh, at this point, I'd like to ask Jesse to bring us up to speed on the options that we've been looking at. So if we're going to dive into options, I think we should hear from Mike first, because we, he has feedback from the school committee about what we're exploring. But One thing of legality. It's not on the agenda. Can we discuss it? I think it falls under the... I think it falls... Well, Mike... So I think it's a really good point, and I think uh, I prefer to do to offer that feedback because I think it'd be relevant in the context of the presentation that I'll sure. that'll come because I think some of the feedback I received and I'm relaying on behalf of the school right, right there and speak here is directly relevant to to the scheme. The, the the yeah, the so I think that's much cleaner in terms of oh, um, what's on the agenda. So I agree with that. <coughs> that's okay with the chair. That works for me. Cleaner. Um, like I'm up. Yep. Okay. Um, <clears throat> after presenting to you last time in our discussion and meeting, and then also receiving your feedback and this email, uh, we developed two additional options, um, and we haven't made any revisions to the first three that we presented yet, and those are forthcoming. Um, let me present the two new ones. This presentation begins with the existing site plan. We diagram <coughs> the flood line that Richard is referring to. Um, which I think you're aware of, and I think we've talked enough about, so I'm going to continue. Well, that's, that's the old flood line. That's yeah, not the, the old one. In the revised right. plan, the flood line is pushed way back to the river. It's not anywhere close. So if it ends up, as Maria was saying, something similar to that, we wouldn't have an issue. Uh, so we we'll move on. So this is, yeah, this is a site plan for option D. 
Option D kind of stems from our discussion last week where we were talking about, well, there could be a, a code minimum upgrade option. And option D is not that. But it's a, it's a less option than our option A, which was our minimal option last time. Um, because we realized that while we'll look at a code minimum option, code unfortunately won't address some of the things that are most important to us in this project. It's, it's definitely a non-starter, such as the acoustic limitations. Um, if we go in the MSBA pipeline, we'd have to address those because they would have acoustic criteria, but strict code wouldn't make us do that. So the site plan here looks very familiar. There's the idea to this option was to um, live within the existing walls um, because the walls are providing a structural um, performance. Um, and so we were trying not to touch the masonry walls, which are contributing to the lateral support of the structure. Um, so this is a very limited option. I mean, we've worked with your program. This footprint lacks 6,000 square feet compared to what your program would require. Um, and so a lot of that square footage is made up with the gym. We're proposing to keep the existing gym, which I realized from the feedback, some people are saying we, we don't think that would work. And that's not been our target. But that's one of the um, first deficiencies of this option, let's say. Um, Another difficult point is that there are four classrooms that, due to the large footprint of the building, four classrooms are getting light from interior courtyards, which is not ideal. Um, go ahead. Well, I would six, seven. I mean, the AIMS, the building blocks programs are also classrooms. Yes, I should have so. said general use classrooms. Yeah. You're right. Uh, you're right. You're right. Seven. Uh, well, six. The AIMS is getting from. From a, a larger court here. Oh, right, the one building, but yes, the six. So I'd be more concerned about these two. Um, see if I can point. Upside down and left Yeah, I can't do it. Okay, yes. I, I agree with you, and I, I missed a good point. Um, but there are some improvements in the building um, with this layout. We have addressed acoustical separation. All the classrooms are now acoustically separated. Each classroom has a toilet, actually. We, we thought, well, we'll keep the existing toilets and, and we'll provide toilets at some of the new classroom spaces that would otherwise be lacking it. So that provides some flexibility, actually. If your kindergarten expands, it, it would still have a toilet. Um, it, or it, it also reduces the load on the toilets in the rest of the space. Uh, we moved the cafeteria into the center of the building. We would imagine there'd be skylight um, bringing natural light into that space. Um, and and it, it does create a public access zone in the center of the building. The classroom blocks could be um, closed off with locking doors. Um, and so that's always one of our goals that's not present in the existing building. Um, I think I'm going to move on. We have a lot to do tonight. And if you want to ask questions about this, it's, it's a compromised option. I guess the question would be, do we need to proceed with it? Yes. Just initial thoughts about um, most kitchens tend to be on the perimeter, so they can get stuff in and out of them. What were the thoughts? You'll notice that feasible? in our other options, we, we have the kitchen very close to the receiving area, or it has its own receiving space. Here, you would be bringing goods in this corridor. We've kept it nearby, but um, it's not directly on the exterior, um, yeah. which we have done before. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I agree, it's not our it's idea. It's not ideal because you would have a receiving area where things get unloaded, stored, staged, and then brought in at the appropriate time to be doing it during the the uh, school day but in the off hours. And then the toilet rooms that are existing could they be renovated? Um, to reduce the number of toilets to then make them accessible? That yes. would be the goal. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So in this option, all the toilets would be brought up to today, including accessible. There, there is a lot of circulation in this, or at least in, in, I have the perception of it, because we were retaining the old corridors. Yes. Um, You're correct, but it's such a deep footprint. That we already had a lot of circulation. <laughs> yes. And we have to get to the inner space, and then we end up with the space between the inner space and the perimeter, and then we need circulation to that as well. Uh, and it's necessary for acoustic separation. So if you're right. To add to that, there are columns on either side of this um, corridor, which is the existing corridor. 
and so that sort of forces us to work with it. It becomes difficult to find another use for that scheme space. Um, whereas we need to add some kind of corridor to the classrooms to partition them up. Right. So you can see it's sort of duplicated. Um, go ahead. Oh, okay. You had your hand up first. <laughs> well, I'm curious, in, in any of these designs, I haven't seen any um, of our current therapeutic space. We have a space that has reflection space and also breakout space. It's kind of in the center of the building as it exists now. And I didn't see that. Room. Um, not the sensory room, it's actually a therapeutic space that's staffed by a therapeutic paraeducator. And I don't know if that's made yeah, like any You're right, you have an OT. That's separate from that as well. That's separate as well. Mm -hmm. Well, we need to add that then to the room list if that's what everyone wants to do. Um, so we've, we've gone through and we're creating this list of what the rooms need to be mm -hmm. programmed. So um, if there's agreement by the group, um, we should adjust that. And what's the name of this room? It's therapeutic space. It's like an intervention space for students that It's not the OT. Yeah. OT is for specific services located by IT. And is it staffed separately? It is. It is. Well, not separately. We have a therapeutic paraeducator who works at that space. Okay. What did you want to say about that? I did. Um, so <coughs> two quick ones. Uh, one, maybe not, I don't know. Setup when I say that. Um, so just having an internal kitchen space, just uh, what comes to mind, I just want to follow up on Heather's point, just from a safety perspective, you know, our deliveries do happen during the school day quite often, and so the advantage of having a separate loading zone is that we don't have deliveries happening while children are walking by with people who don't have quarry checks, and I hate to go to the safety place, but part of my job is what is that. Um, and so just thinking through, given our safety planning, um, I could tell you that um, when we talk about, you know, eventually we meet with the police department and things like that at the <coughs> station, they'll have some questions about the traffic flow of, of people who are at Jack walking to the building during the school day. Uh, I'll save my second one, perhaps later. Yeah, I, there are ways to manage that. I mean, you, for instance, the receiving and storage area could be large enough to actually receive all the deliveries. Right. And uh, that would be kept secure. And someone who's making a delivery either schedules it or buzz, it gets buzzed in and doesn't go beyond that point. Right. So, but that's, yeah. it's, kitchens in the core of a facility do occur. Yeah. Uh, it's not ideal, as I say, but sometimes you're dealing with an existing footprint. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I just, to look at. We've, I don't mean to go back and forth, but we've talked to our vendors previously about deliveries, because for all sorts of reasons, we prefer them not to be done in the school day, even if they had a separate entrance, right. our vendors. Um, have not necessarily felt that that was feasible. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Um, second option, site plan B. Uh, this is addressing the idea of what would happen if you put an addition on the north end of the building. And there are some advantages to this. Um, services, <coughs> gas, um, and electric are coming in to the south end of the building. Um, as well as some of your um, core spaces are on the south end, the cafeteria. Um, so by building a new cafeteria in the north end, in terms of phasing, there's an advantage actually that you can uh, build it and then move the services over to the new space and tear it down the old end. Uh, but in the site plan, you also see some of the challenges. Um, by moving the main entry, um, the cafeteria, um, to the north end, um, and, and also the service, uh, as we mentioned, the service needs to be near the cafeteria and the kitchen. Um, and also because the gymnasium is at that end and the cafeteria is going to need to empty a recess, we're bringing the paved play and the playground. Um, we're really getting some congestion in the north end of the site. Um, so I'm going to go ahead with the floor plan, but yeah, just keep going. Um, and so here is the floor plan we developed. Um, and as I mentioned, we brought all of those functions to the north, which works well in terms of zoning the building for uh, public access. The cafeteria and gym and the administration are, are all right in the same zone, um, whereas academic um, and support wraps around um, this, this new courtyard that's created. Um, so I think. I think there's a lot of linear footage of wall space so that 
while this version of this option, let's say, shows some classrooms still on a courtyard, I think it would be um, possible to adjust this so that all the classrooms are getting good daylight and are on the exterior wall. And one limitation of this option is that this sketch hadn't realized is this sketch shows the enlarged gym, which Richard already referred to as we we found that our structural engineer and we've reviewed it in more detail and it's just not feasible to enlarge the gym. So anytime we add on to the gym to the north, we're going to be accepting the smaller gym which we currently have. Um, and so that's something also to consider in whether this option <coughs> is feasible and whether it's worth continuing with this option. Um, I think I'll I'll stop there. I have a, well, I'll just do the slides quick. So that's a photo of the structure of the gym running all the way up to support the roof, um, which is the problem there. Um, and then this shows the zoning by program, um, academic support wrapping around, public kind of in the middle. We have the district special ed, probably too far off in the wing. We, we try to incorporate them more, but it's a study. And then we have the administration um, right here at the entry with a good sight line of the entire property um, from the north end of the property. And then this is our new versus renovation and demolition diagram. I think that's pretty straightforward. All this gray area is renovation area. We're demolishing um, 20,000 square feet and we're building 24,000 square feet. Um, so um, at least I'll open this up for comment. Here, the gym, you're saying this is a problem, but can it be that the part that is being expanded is like bleachers and spill of space? Um, right. Um, these columns look to be pretty problematic. You you could build some alcoves in here, but it's not it's not terribly wide. Um, so f yes, you could use it for spill off or bleachers, but but in terms of you run into a height problem at some point, it would be pretty low tiers of bleachers. Because you have busy floor. I don't think we expect to have thousands of people, hundreds of people, usually. Even more because, sure. it, because sure. it's going to have a cafeteria with a stage. It's not that we're going to have it as, if we have the cafeteria as an auditorium with a stage, I think it's mainly a spill off when you're having basketball sure. practice or something that you can you be can there. You don't need. You can create alcohol with seats, yes. You can. Sometimes we've done just three high or something. Right. You put 30 people in there. Yes. It helps. Yeah. So you could you could expand it slightly. I agree with that. But you're not going to get to the kind 6, of 6,000. Right. I don't think we need. Well, it's 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 something I think we want to talk about a little bit. Well, yeah. So um, <coughs> can you show me on yeah, that yeah. diagram where the current south wall of the gym is? Is that the dots? Yes. It is the dots. Those okay. are the columns still showing in the model. Okay. Which we deleted Thank the wall. You. Right. So where that slightly darker green is, is that, or maybe it's just showing. It. Yes. No, that's just this. Yeah. 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 Um, right. So uh, yeah, I think that you know, and and everything that is north of that is the current, basically the basketball court. Right. right. So yeah, I think that what maybe it was a miscommunication. Like I I was thinking about not necessarily expanding the entire gym, but as you said, taking that space that is currently storage yes. and having low bleachers. And um, as Ivana said, it, you know, we're not talking about needing you know high school height um, of bleacher expansion. It's, you know, you've got tens of people. Yes, that, that, that's definitely okay. true. Yeah, no problem. So, um, I guess I'll just, this is a good segue or a good moment for me to share, you know, um, feedback that I heard from the school committee because I think it's relevant to this topic. So uh, we talked um, last night about preschool in particular. I raised the topic at the school committee uh, and they brought back that the mission statement that they set for this committee, uh, which is on the website, um, talks about, uh, I'll just read it, this school building committee will limit their consideration consideration of options to a K-6 to elementary school on the Fort River site, elementary school site. So I think there was um, some feeling or some concerns about including a preschool wing when that was not consistent with the mission of what they passed. So since Eric couldn't be there, I'm tasked to bring that 
to uh, to this committee because there was um, some concern that it was inconsistent with uh, the mission and it seemed like a worthwhile conversation. Understood. So we've been uh, let, let's talk about that yeah. because yeah. <clears throat> we have been developing these with the understanding that pre-K that the three classrooms would be pre-K in the in the plan in every option and we were trying to fit that in and, and that was based upon our understanding of the program and I believe that was that it, that's what was consistent with the RFQ that was issued for selection of an architect in was listed. Great. So we actually talked about this at our very first school building committee meeting. Um, and the mission statement uh, was read, and I went back and watched this. Um, and I brought up, I said, you know, I think that this is an oversight because the school committee, to my recollection, had just discussed um, having it include pre-K. And they did discuss it at their October 24th meeting. Eric agreed with me. He thought that there had even been a vote taken. And the idea was, OK, well, double check on that. And we did. And it, um, I looked at the minutes, and I can read you the minutes from the October 4th school committee meeting where it was brought up, and in fact, um, the chair at that time said, you know, do we want to have pre-K? And the response of the committee was consensus that, yes, we want to have pre-K in these considerations. So we have been proceeding as is. So I would be very concerned if we we're going to, if the school committee was, then, was, was now going to tell us that we should not have pre-K in our building options. I mean, I, that sure. wasn't what we had decided, or, or what we were instructed and clarified. Uh, I'll, I'll respond by this yeah. other hand. Up, so. I think this is also a feasibility study. I don't think we are not tied. Um, we don't know if we go with the MSBA, if the concern is funding MSBA that might not fund it. This is just a feasibility study. Let's see how it looks with pre-K. There was always discussion that we need more pre-K down. I think this is the perfect place to keep pre-K and add more pre-K to town. I don't know that the, well, mm -hmm. no, 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 I'm speaking the moment. I don't think that, at least the way I understood it, mm -hmm. the school committee's concern was that it wouldn't necessarily be funded because that's really another but another step beyond ours. Our, yeah. our process ends at this feasibility study where we yeah. have options that we hand off to others to consider. Um, but that, on paper, we have a mandate that doesn't say pre-K, and may, I, I didn't know about that, that piece of, of another vote. If it sounds like we have some ambiguity, I think it would be important to get some clarity. Maybe there's... I don't know if there's enough. Con I don't know. I don't know how much change there has been on the school committee since that time, um, and so part of me wants to acknowledge that yes, they have said this to us that we are supposed to be limited on this. Um, I know this group wants it. Would want to talk about it in, in depth. I'm trying to balance the the need of that versus making sure we give them clear direction <laughs> where to proceed. Um, and make sure we get through as many things as we can tonight. And so I'm trying to a little balancing act. But yeah, and I, I won't speak for the school committee more because I'm not a school committee member. I just right. wanted to say there was four or five people in there last night. Eric wasn't, but I did talk to him today in Chicago, to Ohio, and you know that was the feedback that I was tasked to bring. So I, I'm not here to argue any points or disagree with anyone's opinion, but that was one piece of feedback that they asked me to bring explicitly to this group. I think my concern about preschool is that you know as I look at that. I don't have an operational funding source to fund the people to go into that. So this is not the school committee talking, this is me talking. So I just, I have concerns about adding a wing. It's not because of lack of the need that I agree with that was referenced, but um, you know, that's a three and four hundred thousand dollars. And I get it's a feasibility study, but um, on my feasibility study, of can I pay for people to staff that? I can tell you right now that I have not had years where we were level funded, level service or we even didn't have to make budget cuts in the last few, that's a huge investment of resource to build something when there's not necessarily a known funding source to fill the staffing of that. It, so it's a complicated question because it does go to operation, operational costs. Yeah. It goes to demographics. What, yeah. what do your demographics say about this? So I, I don't expect clarity tonight. <laughs> I appreciate what the school committee has expressed to you, but 
we, we were hired by the town, and we received direction from this building committee, yep. which uh, is authorized by the town to execute this feasibility study. So we take our marching orders from you. So if you need to regroup and get back to us, that's fine. But we, we are then kind of stuck. Um, right, you need you need a path. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Brian, then. Yeah, I really, I, I, I really don't think there was any ambiguity. I mean, I think we, we got clarity. We, it, it was, it was certain from the beginning, and we have been proceeding. And this was November of 2017 that we had our first meeting, right. and we talked about it. And we, this, this has included pre-K the entire way through, even through all of the, um, the space summaries. Um, this is not, this is not news that pre-K is part of what we are doing, so. Yeah. Just, uh, did you need to have pre-K in order to get MSBA's funding? Is no, that no, no, it's okay. just board yeah. <laughs> they don't fund it, right. okay. Actually, I do want to clarify that a little bit. Uh, one of the reasons it's a long day for me and Jesse <laughs> is that very early this morning, we were at an MSBA meeting to review uh, another project. And pre-K is part of that program and they were very optimistic about funding that. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's not something that MSBA won't fund. I mean, I think they've been coming around. So um, I, I think you need, but that's funding of the building. It's not funding of operations. Right. So that's a bigger question that the school committee needs to, to tell you. Support. I think I think we don't want to get stuck because today you're going to go home and you need to keep working on the ideas, right? We are on a clock. I think I would suggest, since it's a feasibility, let's include it. If later, when, if it is, when it goes to the second phase and we're going to have to have schematics and we decided what's the funding and the town decides or the school committee says we cannot include pre-K, then the new drawing is doing the, they won't include pre-K. But at this point, I think we sh it's a feasibility. We don't, we are not producing the final blueprints that are going to be built. Um. Right. Yeah. So just two quick comments, and, and I agree with you. We should get to the rest of the slides. Um, so I think one thing is, since this is on the website and it says something different than what is being produced, some right. communication maybe from this committee to the school committee around that topic, right? Because I'm not. I just want to be really clear. I'm not interested in arguing about whether preschool should be included or not on behalf of the school committee. That's not my role, I was asked to communicate their concern, um, and that's what I'm doing. And just the ambiguity or the lack thereof in this statement versus what's being produced, um, or the conflicts perhaps in the perception of what here on paper, what they voted, what they believe they voted, and what's being worked on does need to be resolved, and hopefully in an amicable way that doesn't leave hit side against side, because that's not going to be helpful for anybody. So I think thinking about ways to communicate perhaps even before November 27th around this issue would be kind of my proposal. The second thing that is perhaps not for today, but just that I'd be curious from the architectural point of view is uh, whether, let's say in the end, we get to a place where preschool is not part of it, it's in the designs now, does that actually throw off the whole building? Like, is that just like, oh, okay, we just don't do this. Right. No big deal, schematics, we make those changes. Or is, oh my god, if we don't have this wing, then it influences all these other things, because if it's the former, no issues. If it's the latter, then I do think more clarity for your perspective is needed on the sooner side. Um, and I don't know the, I'm not an architect, I don't know It, the it depends on the option. Right. So in the new building option, it's really integrated with the footprint of a, a two-story building, for example. Um, so that's more difficult to unravel. Okay. Uh, whereas other simpler options... Is it in the renovations where we're often trying to fit inside of that? Good point. The removing that square footage gives us some options, yeah. whereas trying to fit everything's crammed in there, so it would, it would help um, in terms of fitting into mm -hmm. an existing building for person. Right. I think at the same time as we see in for river space, the reconfigure that used in different ways that was original set. So I think even if it's not used for the original purpose, it's going to get used. However, maybe not on the most square footage. Yeah. Yeah. So I would encourage you to hone in on as close as you can to the square footage that you need 
so that you can get a budget that's that's accurate. When is the next school committee meeting? Is it the 22nd of October? I mean, I feel like was that? Yes. Of yeah. Um, yeah. I'm certainly not comfortable proceeding in defiance of the latest direction from the school committee. I mean, I, I think there. I don't know if like. The school committee had at their disposal last night as part of the discussion, their previous discussion, and I think it would help to make it full circle, just like you were saying. So, but I don't know. So the twenty, we're at like the it's like yeah. two weeks away. Yeah. That, that's going to set us like a month back because they meet on the twenty second, and then it's off schedule with our meeting. That sets up almost a month of you see. The we would be meeting the next day. Right now we're one day apart. <coughs> I think we do need to have some communication. Um, at the same time, we need to to be able to make sure that Richard can proceed. Um, I mean, I guess. I'm, oops, sorry. So, can I ask why this Amherst School Committee is saying that they would now like us to change direction and take pre-K out of these plans? So again, I feel an awkward space to, to talk about why other people said certain things. I'll do my best, but I want to. There's a limitation because I'm not a school committee member, so I want to just. I know I say that a lot, but I think it's really important to be for me to say it. So I, I do think some of it's around communication that that particular aspect has not necessarily been communicated to the committee members. So I think some of this uh, perhaps is around. Um, I'm going to speak to a positive because um, I think this is a tension point in the committee for sure. Two positives. One, they're deeply appreciative of the volunteer work that's gone on here. They said that multiple times last night. And the second is they want to get kind of more connected to the work as, as the work has now progressed. Um, instead of quick updates at school committee meetings, you know, they're very enthusiastic about the November 27th. And so I do think it's sort of some of it's about communication, you know, where we are, where we've been, and other things they've been working on, other things we've been working on, the district's been working on. So, that's probably the best I can do, because I don't want to be out of turn and speak in more directly for other people who aren't in the room. I mean, I just, I mean, I just have to read from October 17, 2017, our school committee, Board of Rebuilding Committee members' selection and mission statement. Ms. Hazard explained that the mission statement for the Fort River Building Committee does not mention pre-K and asked if the committee is comfortable changing the language to reflect pre-K instead of kindergarten. Mr. Demling noted that he would not want to restrict the committee's work and would be comfortable adding pre-K. Mr. Nakajima noted that it would make sense to have this information. It was agreed by consensus to make the change. I mean, that's before we even met. Is there a possibility that the school committee forgot about that? I mean, it's like we might be talking about something that's just not. And, that's and, and it's entirely issue. possible that, that, I mean, miscommunications can happen yeah. in multiple directions. Um, we posted what we thought was the right document, um, and it doesn't include the words pre K. Um, we may simply have posted the wrong document. It may not have been formally updated, even though they took a vote on it. Um, and so, after hearing that, my inclination, because <clears throat> I think we need to have some conversation and it, at least maybe that means me reaching out as the chair to the other chair and saying um, we were basing our thinking on this meeting and this information um, we understand that at the moment you you have a different understanding um, can you can you clarify this with me um, and that might be a lot that would might allow me well before uh, the 22nd to give you some sense of direction if the committee is okay with me kind of taking that on and, and having a conversation. One thing also is I think communication. All the press releases we have included in pre K to six. It has been out in March since March or I think the first press release was in March. Right. Yeah. Ever so all the press releases for the last six months have said pre K to six. Um, so I would feel very uncomfortable now changing it all. By the way, we're changing it to K to six. Um, after one year of been working on the base of pre K to six. Well, I wouldn't like necessarily making the change. If it's a clear direction from them, we would have to kind of accept it. But I think we need to find out whether they, whether they they've seen what, we've, what we believe we've seen. And so I think it's worth 
reaching out, having some communication that's that's between formal meetings. So. I think we are almost ten months in. Right? right. No, I understand that, and I, my my hope is that we that it gets communicated and resolved in a direction that that supports the position we think we have. So. Maria? I'm going to make a suggestion. We have consultants here. Yep. We have. We need to keep our committee moving forward. Yes, so do. I'd like to continue with that. Um, I think it would be fine to, for you to talk to the school committee, but I am not comfortable making any decision um, for this committee with regards to changing what I believe is our direction um, without that coming back to be, have a public discussion. And that's fine. You know, again, I, I did not intend to create tension in the committee. I just came as a communicator. I think that public discussion also has to be about funding. Mm -hmm. You know, so separate from school committee and what folks they took. So I'm speaking again. It's my role, not as uh, elected official. Um, I do have significant concerns about the operational implications of um, preschool um, in terms of funding. So that's not here, there, or there. It's not about what, who said what at a certain time. I think it just has to be part of the public discussion because just because we built a space doesn't that's not the end of the funding challenge that we have for the school. We need to ask Jesse. We talked about it starting the matrix. Have you started that well? We did. Um, yeah. That's that's where we began. So the idea here was we have developed options A through E at this point. Um, and they all reflect the four hundred and twenty student enrollment, which includes pre K and um, and we've also talked about a, a smaller enrollment, which is based more on the existing student population, um, which would be 360. Which is without pre -K. No, that's with pre-K as well. But it's smaller um, K through 6 population okay. as, as currently in school. And then we went and just extrapolated um, what those numbers would be without pre-K, and then even potentially without 6th grade, because that's also been a discussion topic in the town. Well, I realize the school committee hasn't directed us to do that, and I realize there's a separate study that's going on as to whether that makes any sense at all. Um, and I think, I mean, if this is valuable, it, it does show you a range of student populations, which relates to school size. It also shows you a potential of 30 studies that we could go down, <laughs> which is daunting, and we're going to scream. Um, but that's not what we're saying to offer. But it does occur to us that this study perhaps could pick up from these other columns as well. I don't know um, if that makes sense to you. Yeah. We owe you a range. So if you want to rethink that range and pick from column A, column B, or however you want to do it, um, maybe this, this might help. Mike? Yeah, and just one helpful thing. It's a different topic, but just, you know, the school committee does plan to vote in less than a month about future programming at Fort River, which gives some sense between the larger and smaller sizes. So I think, you know, we have a lot of unknown variables, but at least one of those dominoes likely will fall one way or the other within a month, which hopefully be helpful for you to narrow the range okay. a bit. And, and ultimately, if down the line uh, pre-K were to happen, that also would be a school committee vote. I mean, it would, because of the funding issue that you've talked about, it's something they have to commit to, just like they have to commit to moving or not moving sixth graders or doing dual language, it's, it's something that they they need to formally decide at some point. Yeah, and that's why I hope, you know, we can get to an amicable place on this, whatever the resolution is. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to say Diana's question, because I was going to say, can we move on? Do we have to take a vote about having you talk to the school committee, or can we I, just do that? <laughs> I, I think I can just do that, okay. you know. <laughs> Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll reach out okay. and, and uh, you know, if, if other folks want to participate in that conversation, I don't have to do it alone. Um, I think but, it just sounds like a, a seriously, it sounds like just something they forgot yeah. that they took that other And if that's the case, it might be easily resolved, to too. And so, so and if I'm, they have, yeah, yeah we'll, so we'll find out more. Run. If we can. <laughs> yes. <laughs> do, do people, can, is everybody ready to move on? Yeah. Okay. Go. <laughs> You will have gone by at that point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now it's gotten okay? nice and warm in here for like, uh, various reasons. I know. All right, so shall we turn it over? Yeah, just one very quickly. Um, sustainability is obviously important to us. It's important to your community as well. Um, I'm going to introduce Chris in just a second. I just want to put this in the context of in our study, we're developing these options. Eventually, they're going to go for a cost estimator. 
And so one of our goals tonight is to talk about goals for sustainability, that'd be first, and also that we could get some strategies that we are incorporating into narratives that are given to the cost estimator, which is as a basis for these cost analysis. So at first we were going to open it up and just have a discussion, but that is the, that is the overarching goal, that we have systems we can proceed with. Well, ultimately, we'll have three or four options on each of those 30. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll look at all my <laughs> that makes uh, different options to get prices for those. Well, we'll have set the costs and then we'll go to that. That will be done in the next 2023. Yeah. No, it's like, it's like our last time. So, um, you know, talking about sustainability, just like there are tensions around which of the schemes uh, that you're going to. Uh, ultimately end up with, there, there are tensions within each of the schemes and about different sustainability strategies. And one of the big ones is aligning some of the sustainability goals around especially energy that, that the town has established, along with the desire to, to the extent practical and possible, reuse what's there. So in some cases, reuse and renovation options have less opportunities to do this sort of energy interventions, whereas a brand new building, we could you know, do virtually anything with that. So that, that's a tension that, that's there that we feel and we are seeking the town's guidance on direction as we give you more details of, of what that, that means. But I wanted to start with just thinking about the big picture about sustainability. Because it's, energy is an important part of it, but, but fundamentally it comes down to <coughs> four things that, that you've identified, which are really, I count the ands, I guess 11 things. Um, and so just to walk through each of these, the first thing is we want a building that's going to be safe and healthy. And so that starts with a good learning environment, good air, good light, and spaces. Uh, and then the materials that are in the building are healthy materials. And ultimately, it's just not safe and healthy for the, the students and the staff. It's healthy for the community, and it's, it's healthy for the world. So material choices affect not only the health and well-being of the students there, but ultimately where those materials are manufactured and where they're disposed of, and that's all, all part of that. So that's a, a key first piece. The second thing that's very important to us is to be resource efficient. So obviously energy efficiency and all the issues around carbon are, are there, uh, and, but efficient in all our resources, including money. So I always say that wasting money is not a sustainable strategy, and we want to we want to pick the things that get the biggest return on investment. That's part of the analysis that we'll go through. Uh, you know, the team will go through is to look at what things cost and what kind of return you get on those, whether it's purely dollars or, or other benefits coming out of it. And then the last two are kind of related. Uh, buildings are potentially something that's in your community for a long period of time. And so we want to, to the extent we can, be able to be flexible and adaptable to future needs. Uh, at the same thing, meeting current needs. Um, so uh, there's a concept of loose fit, long life, and you design everything down to exactly what you've got in the building right now. It's, those things are going to change, and you know we don't want to be back here in a few years saying we've got to we've got to change it because it doesn't work anymore. Um, and then that goes along with uh, the selection of materials, and especially thinking about how things are maintained in the building. And that really goes into the energy systems and the mechanical systems. Uh, the reality is that the mechanical systems are going to wear out before other things do, and they're going to need to be replaced. The structure of the building might be 100 years, the mechanical systems might be more like 25 or 30, uh, the IT system could be obsolete by the time you put it in, and so yeah. you need to be able to, to accommodate all of those, uh, uh, those changes. Uh, so maintainable and, uh, and, and durable, cleanable, you know, be able to change the filters all those kinds of things are really important to us. So that's the big picture of the sustainability. Now, a big focus is the energy piece. And so we're trying to figure out how to get to zero carbon. Um, and should, so should we remind the committee of what the town regulation pertaining to zero carbon? Yeah, well, you, you have the regulation that says you have to build new public buildings and achieve the zero net energy, right? Yeah. Paraphrasing. So if you're renovating a building, that doesn't apply, right? But if you're building a, a big addition to an existing building, the portion that's the addition has to achieve. And I, I think, and I'm, I'm sure someone will chime in if they disagree with it, I think as a committee, we feel like there has to be a certain parity even in the renovation models that we, we can't just, even though the bylaw may say, oh no, you know, 
doesn't have to do that. I think we feel, uh, and I don't know what the level of commitment is, but that we need to, we just can't uh, put the windows in and say, we really want to address some of the, the energy usage. Um, well, remember in this range of options, the base building option, which is to bring the building up to code, right. has, has, that does not need to meet the net zero energy regulation. That's true. If you go above the base building, bringing the building up to code, that's your choice. But I think we owe you the base building option so that you have baseline. Right. Uh, I think this goes to something that was mentioned at an earlier meeting. Yep. Uh, I think it may have been Eric that said he wants, or maybe there's other people as well, who said that we want to be able to compare to see the magnitude of the existing problems in the building and what will it take to bring it up to speed, just a base level, and so that we have some basis of repairs. There's one more piece on that, the town regulation as well as not just to be net zero, but to be net zero and be fossil fuel free. So we're not yes. offsetting natural gas consumption with, with uh, renewable generation. Yes, thank you. So that, that's an important part of that. So as we think about getting to zero carbon, uh, you know, so I think net zero buildings are a great goal. Uh, our, our real interest is thinking about net zero earth, net zero communities, and so uh, frankly a little less interested in making sure we match the amount of renewable generation with the energy consumption of every single building and instead figuring out how we make buildings as energy efficient and low carbon as possible, and then think about how we do renewable uh, generation. And so we've come down to four things. The first is the low EUI, energy utilization index, energy per square foot. The second thing to think about is decarbonizing our heat, so not using natural gas, using some sort of a heat pump technology for heating. And then we think about where we can do renewables such as solar on site, you know, rooftop, on new buildings, that's pretty easy to do that. Um, it may be that, uh, and we've seen a lot of communities think about uh, solar <coughs> as a separate but related project. Uh, you know, so, so maybe all the solar for a, a school isn't actually on the school, it's owned by the town somewhere else, and we think of those things and ultimately <coughs> zeroing out the town's consumption. And then that goes to the idea of the community re renewables and ultimately our hope that we will see the, the grid, which has gotten quite a bit greener here in, in Massachusetts already over the last few years, continue to do so, so that ultimately our all-electric building will be getting carbon-free electricity from wherever, and, and, and that'll, that'll do everything. So that, that's like the long-term vision there. Although I think there's, there is some tying together in the bylaw between the renewables and the actual project. Right, it might be a little different. You, yeah, yeah, places. your rules yeah. say that. I'm, I'm I know you're talking we, about. We think we think about yeah. this. Is, there, there's, like I said, there's a lot of tension here. So if we were looking at renovating the building, one of the big issues there is you've got. And, uh, Frank's going to get into this a little bit more. That you've got gas boilers that are there now that do hot water heating. From what we understand, those are relatively new installations. And so does does this really mean we want to throw those away and and pursue another option? And maybe it does. But there's some tension there if we're, if we're in those options. Let me just real quick get to this, and then Frank can show his stuff that will get us into more details. That school building there, is it significant? Is that Dreesley building? That's, that's the Nelson Place Elementary in, uh, in Worcester that we finished about a year ago. And what's significant about <coughs> it is they are uh, net zero electricity. So they um, actually, we looked at it, studied it, and the town ultimately decided to go ahead and install gas boilers. Um, so they're able to offset their electricity consumption with the solar on site, but, but they still burn gas and make carbon. So they have a little EUI. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is basically the, the building shell is built to passive house standards. So it's the R30 walls, R60 roofs, triple glazed windows, and it's able to do that for a, a, you know, an MSBA budget because that also downsides the system. That would, So one thing to note is that our codes have gotten more stringent over time, and so currently we are on the IECC 2015 for new construction, and uh, compared to where we were five or six years ago, that's about a 30% uh, more stringent code than, than what we, we had, and uh, likely within the time frame that this building project may happen, there may be additional codes that is scheduled for another code cycle update next year. Um, so codes continue to ratchet over time to, to get more, more energy efficient. 
And so the typical strategy that people have taken over the years to try to get to net zero is to drive the energy consumption down to a low level and then to make up the difference with, with uh, renewables. We're never going to get to zero consumption in the building because you'd like to be able to turn the lights and plug turn things the in and yeah. Yeah, <laughs> maybe move some air around and <coughs> you know, the plug loads and the, and the lights certainly are going to be there and they're going to get energy from somewhere. So one of the things we started to look at was what possible energy targets might there be and what's, what's the context for this. So this is really rough estimates based on the Energy Star uh, database, something called the CBEX data. CBEX is the Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey the federal government has done. The last update was in 2012. So in that database, you can adjust for things like location and, and use. An average school in that database would have an EUI of about 65. Um, and based on an 82,000 <coughs> school and average Massachusetts energy costs, that would be an annual energy cost of about $117,000 a year. You compare that to a building that was designed to meet energy codes, would be that high performance green building would be a lead building and then net zero. <coughs> there was a, a huge jump from the green building that would be minimally lead compliant and still would probably be looking at a little less than a buck a square foot for energy versus that net zero building that hopefully would be uh, zero energy cost as well as uh, zero EUI. One of the things we want to do is, is put this in context of what your current consumption is as well and, and understand how that, that fits into this. We have your utility rates and something we can yeah, we're work with. Yeah, we're going to put that next step here. Is this a way to define where a renovation should be? Well, yeah, I think one of the things we want to think about in our renovation is what is, what's the current consumption and how much can we reduce that? And so if we were able to look at the current consumption and see that it's a pretty low performing building, we would expect that we would have much more room for improvement than if it was already a pretty high performing building. There's lots of room for improvement. <laughs> <laughs> I can guarantee it's a pretty low performing building. <laughs> uh, so to get to energy efficiency, there's, there's five basic strategies we're going to follow through. The first is to try to reduce the, the need for energy consumption, reducing demand. And the advantage of that is that it also means the systems get smaller. So a simple example, if we put in better insulation in the roof, then we have a smaller heating system. So we save upfront and we save energy over time. Second is look at what's there on site already that we can use natural light, breezes, maybe energy recovery from exhaust streams. Then we look at efficient equipment important we do those other two things first the efficient equipment is right sized and then the last two are really about how you're going to run the, the, the building got to have a building commission make sure that the design intent has been realized and communicated and then the building's got to be operated in a way that makes sure it's energy efficient that goes back to making sure the building is maintainable over time but if you do those first three terrifically and you screw up four and five then it doesn't really matter so we really need to, yeah. to, to squeeze on those. What have I got here? So this goes to this heating idea. This is a study we did for an independent school here in Massachusetts who had an existing steam power plant, and they were doing a climate action plan. They had multiple buildings on their campus. And uh, what we see from just because of our electric grid here is by simply switching from uh, uh, some sort of fossil fuel power to heat pumps, we are cutting the CO2 emissions associated with heating by 50% or more. So ground source heat pumps are great. They get to a really low number, but air source heat pumps, split systems, VRFs, and the system we're going to be talking about here in a second, get pretty close at a, at a budget price. And so those are things that we definitely want to be thinking about depending on the options that we're looking towards. And then my final two here. Just some context, if we are going to ultimately get MSBA funding for the project, which I know is a potential desire, you're probably aware that we need to be either LEED version 4 certified or Greenland ships verified, and we also need to show 10% better than code, so it's equivalent to being stretch code compliant. And there's an additional 2% reimbursement if we can exceed the energy code by 20%. So that um, you know, gives us sort of a, a baseline for what our energy target should be. I think we should be making sure we're meeting at least those and hopefully going far beyond those. Should we think of this as a lead project? Well, I have to admit, I don't personally know much about the requirements of the NE chips. And so, since we're, we have to choose a path, um, 
uh, yeah, do one of those. And I'm a little curious to hear about the differences. Um, you were right. There's another 30 slides on this. <laughs> <laughs> we, we hit it back I was that I have about 10 yeah. yeah. slides on this versus these that you don't need to hear about. But well, I think that I guess I, my question probably should have been, do we need to be either lead or New England chips? Because I think that could figure into our cost estimating at this very early phase. Um, I, I, I think we should, just, I think we should assume something like yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, the, the not knowing the other. I mean, I think that would be guaranteeing in this community that, that that would be an expectation, not just the, the the state's requirements. I don't know. Others can feel free to speak. Well, the other reason that would be very valuable um, as a, a community talking, if, if we can use LEAD as a rating system, it will help distinguish between our options. So we're presenting information to the community. It lead because it does take into consideration, and I don't know, I, I don't know what the chips either, but um, uh, it gives you points for reusing existing things. And so when we talk about renovation versus new construction, lead already built into a sort of a, compare, a way to weight the value of energy consumption versus some of the compromises you make to hold on to the embodied energy of an existing building. So I think not only do we want to meet these for those reasons, but it also becomes a very valuable way for us to start to um, distinguish between um, the quality of, of what we're getting um, when we choose one of these schemes. Right. It's a way to score the options. <coughs> I'll give you the 30-second. Leaders and chips, if that's okay. Yes. Yeah, so, and chips are run very similar. Their rating system is designed for schools, lead to schools, New England chips. New England chips is focused a little more on the specifics of the New England region, and it has a section about operations that doesn't exist in lead. So, uh, some districts say that is a good thing, others say we to engage more people, and it's going to be a pain in the neck. We just want to get our, our MSBA money, we don't want to do that. Uh, the other big difference is that. Chips, you can't get the final certification until after the full commissioning process. So you're typically not getting your uh, final sign off from MSBA until more than a year after occupancy. Lead, uh, you're, you're probably looking at uh, six months to nine months less time uh, before that happens. And so that's a big deal with some districts as well. Uh, but they both are very thorough uh, green building rating systems that address the things that you're doing. Do they have similar impacts on cost? In other words, do we have to choose between them, or can we simply say yes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at this stage, yeah, at okay. this stage. I mean, I, I would say for the purposes of feasibility studies, saying that it's going to be certified in some way is enough for them to make sure that the pricing is built in there. You certainly wouldn't want to go to bid giving yes. the contract with the option. That wouldn't work. No. <laughs> Okay. So, so can I can I ask what um, do you recommend that we do one or over the other? Or do, do you do you have a recommendation about which we should score on? I would or turn we score to, on both. We, I would turn to Chris. We we've, we've done both. I think our personal preference, because we think the pathway would be a little easier for the design team, is lead. But we're fairly agnostic on it. Honestly, I think that. A, a district or a school that wants to engage in the operational strategies, CHIPS is, is better suited for that. Um, so, so I don't see that as a, yeah. we, we've, we've done both. We've done more LEED than CHIPS, but because we do LEED for all kinds of buildings, CHIPS are really only public schools, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And really only in Massachusetts. We've well, done many, many times. It's a method that we're very familiar with. So if you were to ask us, yeah. We've done 169 lead projects and we had about 10 chips projects. So. We don't have to make an absolute choice. I don't think Certainly, don't need to decide yeah. anything yeah. tonight. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Set me up, I'll set you up. <laughs> okay. Oh, one more slide, Chris. Oh, yeah. Uh, so then the final thing was that there is significant funding if we uh, go down the heat pump path. So you hear me saying it again, I think this is a good good thing if we can figure out a way to decarbonize the heat using heat pumps. Uh, so we've got utility incentives through Mass Save that we would have just like any other electric customer. Uh, that Mass Clean Energy Center has specific incentives for heat pumps, uh, depending on the capacity. And then there is something now that's just out recently called alternative energy credits, which people usually unfortunate uh, in aches. 
Uh, <laughs> these are basically like solar solar wrecks, if you're familiar with how those work. Anybody got solar, they sell their S wrecks, and you get a check back. Uh, the idea here is that a heat pump, for every one unit of energy you're putting in, you might be getting two or three units of heating out of it. And so three minus one, the two units you got from the environment are considered alternative energy, and you can get credit for that. You can get those for up to 10 years. Uh, the size of the building we're talking about here, you get quarterly payments, just like the SREX. If you're doing it for your house, just out of information, they'll actually cut you a check for the whole 10 years up front, probably going to your contractor so they can defray the cost of the system. Mike? Not so much for the last move. For the other incentives, how does that work when you're in an MSBA project? Is there some, is that, how do it's, they it's manage? It's part of, part of the application process, the forms that need to be filled out, and they have to go through a certification yeah. process. But, but, yes. but the, the incentive the question is, do they go back to MSBA yeah. to get the yeah. kingdom? Uh, it used to be that the MSBA always just took, the, re reduced your uh, right. reimbursement by that amount. Uh, my understanding is that the utilities have been working on that, and so there is, potentially some share uh, on that. And, and certainly the alternative energy credits, uh, they would come in over time and do a completely different thing. Oh, I understand the question. You were talking about does a grant offset MSBA money? Right. Is exactly. that the question? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't ask it clearly. Yeah. And that was the answer. That's, that's the answer. Yeah. Okay, and now we're going to switch gears a little bit. and. Uh, Frank's going to lead us through some of the systems that we could use to so, meet our energy goals. Uh, you want to come back? Yeah. Okay. You can stay in for a time, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, anyone in Catch One Am, I'm Frank Gray from Cold Running. Uh, I specialize in HVAC design. I do a lot of mechanical systems. Uh, and for our projects, we, we took a look uh, consideration. I actually have more business cards than me. Uh, but we took some considerations based off of the uh, uh, the concepts that were proposed and potential to not only be net zero, uh, not use fossil fuels, but also some of the limitations with the existing building itself. Uh, so we were initially proposing uh, five systems, um, all of them uh, have in common the use of a, a dedicated outside air system or DOAS unit. Uh, which is primarily designed to provide ventilation to the building. Um, I'll get into more details um, but in that a little bit. But the, uh, the, the first three systems kind of picking back on, on the use of electricity as your, 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 your means for, for generating cooling and heating, um, you utilize a VRF system, a variable refrigerant flow system. Um, option one, two, and three are very similar. Um, Option one would, would be air-cooled units. Option two would be water-cooled units, possibly a geothermal system. Uh, option three is very similar to option two, uh, and that is also water-cooled, except it's, instead of using geothermal, you're using a cooling tower. But performance-wise, they're, they're fairly similar. Um, options four and five, um, we've had success in, in schools and office buildings and, and many other projects using utilizing chill beams. Um, that would use water source heat pumps, um, and as well would be water cooled using either a geothermal system or a, a cooling tower. Um, so to go into a little more details, um, one of the reasons for proposing the use of a DOAS systems um, and realizing if you do continue on the, the proposed option of keeping your existing building, um, one of the limitations we, are, we would be working with is uh, the existing structure existing roof heights, um, and the, the roof is pitched and does have some low points. Um, so the benefit to the DOAS system is it does minimize some of your, uh, your, your ductwork distribution through your building um, and switches more of the heat transfer to piping. In general, piping um, is a better means to transfer energy than a, a duct. Uh, a pipe, you can, might be able to get a, a ton of cooling out of a 3 4 inch pipe, whereas a duct would be an 8 to 10 inch duct, so there's a huge difference there. So there's a major benefit to, to going down this road, not only from an energy efficiency standpoint, but also from the view of trying to potentially use the existing building uh, ceiling cavity. Making things fit. Making things fit, yes. Um, certainly there, there are alternatives that could be um, 
pursued, but they do pose unique challenges, whether or not things can fit and how they get accepted <coughs> architecturally, whether it's soffits, and it does pr pr present a lot of unique challenges if you go down that road. Um, so with a DOS, as I mentioned, you would potentially have uh, a rooftop unit on the top right, top left, um, could be indoor equipment, uh, and you would have ductwork distribution similar to the, the bottom left dispersed through your building and presenting outside air either to the, the zone directly, the classroom, office, might, what might have you, or possibly to your, your indoor VRF or chill beam uh, piece of equipment. Uh, so pursuing one of the alternative might um, to supplement that would be your, your geothermal system. Um, that has wells that get distributed through your site. Um, they could range anywhere from 400 to 450 feet in depth. Uh, the quantity would be coordinated with whatever our cooling and heating loads use for the building. Um, one of the unique challenges with that, it, while it is a, a very efficient system, uh, it does have a high initial first cost uh, that needs to be weighed in and considered. Uh, the other downside is you also have to realize where we can put the wells um, with the potential that you have to keep your current school in operation and whether or not you're having an addition or um, renovating, it's a matter of finding out where those wells can go um, and where they can be installed mm -hmm. to keep the building running. Um, with this system, we would have uh, water source heat pumps. Uh, those pieces of equipment would be located indoors someplace and they generate hot water and chill water. Uh, and that hot water and chill water would be uh, distributed to your, um, whether it be chill beams or uh, it could be used as a means for heat rejection for um, your VRF system. No questions so far? Well, in order to install a geothermal well to field, you would need to probably tear up the play fields. It, yes, you could you could locate them below, theoretically below your. But they could be. Yeah, you could build new play fields. You could you could locate it below a soccer field, baseball fields. All the piping would be yeah. several feet below grade. Good. Uh, so if you do have, I mean, there's a lot of field on, on site right now, which could be used. But again, it does take a large, uh, large area to to sort of accommodate. Um, one of the, the other options I mentioned was the VRF system. So uh, this one is an air-cooled system. I mentioned you have condensing units located outside. This is the one on top left. From those outside uh, condensing units, you'd have refrigerant piping that would be distributed to your, your indoor uh, VRF units. Um, similarly, you'd be using a DOAS unit for ventilation. Your VRF units would be providing your localized cooling. Um, you don't need a uh, chill water or hot water system, which is one of the benefits. Um, capable of both heating and cooling. Some of the downsides is they don't always look very pretty. Um, so the top right is the VRF cassette. It basically comes in two colors, white and off-white. Um, <laughs> and it's really based on who you're purchasing the equipment for, because they come in one color from whoever manufactures them. There are some alternatives. You could certainly do uh, wall-mounted units. Uh, you could do ducted units. Ducted units are a little more costly than, say, a ceiling cassette um, because you're, you're adding ductwork distribution, insulation hangers, etc. Um, you do have to consider uh, this. These heat pumps would be located under roof. Um, there's a lot of flexibility of how far they can be located from from your indoor units. Uh, which, if desired, you could possibly put them on grade a little bit further from the building. Um, but if you place them on the roof, it does take away the potential for your PV array up on the roof. Um, it is uh, less efficient as far as as it, freezing temperatures um, are achieved. So the, the colder it gets, the less efficient they become. Uh, a lot of equipment does get derated. There are a couple manufacturers which uh, offer 100% heat capacity at 32 degrees or even zero. Uh, but a lot of times as you approach those lower single digit numbers, you start to, to take an efficiency hit. So a lot of the equipment will be sized for heating uh, for the building and not necessarily just cooling. Um, similarly, um, along the VRF lines, you have your so air cooled, you have your water cooled. Um, this would be paired with either 
geothermal system or uh, a cooling tower, um, potentially in, in a boiler. Um, as far as indoor equipment, it's very similar. Top left sort of gives you an example of some um, VRF cassette units, um, all of which you know architecturally would have to coordinate, make sure visually they're acceptable and they function properly. Um, distribution from your uh, floor cool condensing units would be very similar to the heat pumps. You have refrigerant piping that runs out to your indoor units. Um, it would also be paired with a DOAS system. Um, similarly, it doesn't require chill or hot water piping. It's um, a little bit more costly than your air-cooled heat pumps in that you, you're looking at adding uh, a geothermal system or some other means of heat rejection. Uh, Isn't one of the issues that you end up with lots of mechanical units distributed throughout the building? Indoor, potentially, yes. Okay. So you could you could <coughs> have a couple ways um, with, with the VRF system. You could have a ducted unit, for example, per classroom. You could have one to two ceiling cassettes per classroom. Um, if you have offices, you could either do a single wall-mounted unit um, or do a ducted unit serving multiple spaces. Um, but you do tend to have a lot of uh, indoor units sort of spread out. Right. And each one of those does have like a, a filter, which needs to be considered, so there's a little lot of maintenance there. But question? Just a quick one. Right now in the building, how is fresh air handled? Or is it handled? <laughs> Might be uh, so there, I believe there's there's uh, unit ventilators on yes. low on the okay. wall. So uh, you know they're they're old. So for all I know, the outside air dampers could be closed. They could be open, and whatever's being exhausted through toilet exhaust is just pulling in through infiltration. Drawing something. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm not sure. I do know that I think there's a potential mold issue. Um, so one of the benefits of having a dough is you you are controlling the amount of outside air you bring to your space. When you're Treating it. So, with the current system, uh, because it's not functioning as it's intended to, you have building infiltration and not treat outside air making its way through the building, which is and, a problem. And on that DOS, so you're bringing in a verifiable amount of outside air to each place, regardless right. of the need for heating or cooling, and it's going through energy recovery so that you're, any heat you're exhausting, the atmosphere capture is going to be used instead. So, so, it gives you some humidity control? Uh, it would well, yes. Yeah. So in, in all our systems, um, the that we're proposing the DOAS unit is intended to provide uh, not only treatment of outside air, but also to provide your latent cooling load, um, with the intent that you don't have condensate at your VRF units or your chill beams. All that's handled at your your DOAS unit. Um, it, won't, one, it won't be hot and sticky. Yeah, it won't be like this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So. Um, you have up there that this the water cooled um, VRFs require supplemental heating, but when you talk about the air cooled, you're talking about it, it, it having trouble when you get down to freezing temperatures. Right. So yeah. would you recommend having a supplemental? We would have some sort well. of means to inject heat into the loop. So whether that's uh, and because we don't don't want to use fossil fuels, that would most likely be an electric boiler. I'm sorry. That would most likely be an electric boiler. To to supplement either the water or air cooled. The air cool, you can size the outdoor equipment for heat with the intent that as you approach zero, you're only able to get, say, 75% of your heating capacity. So you can upsize your outdoor equipment to handle the load at your design cooling temperature. If you did the geothermal, then this wouldn't be an issue. Right, right. right. Yeah, Mike. It's a quick question about the, we did this one before, we were talking about the, the units that go, I mean, all of these may have some ceiling so units. These two are similar. Yeah. Right. Um, just to the question of, you know, in some of the models, the renovation models that don't have a tremendous number of amount of daylighting, you know, I remember there's been some dialogue about <coughs> lighting from above, how would that interface, I mean, you know, is it possible to do both? In other words, that systems like the ones that's on the screen as well as adding some daylighting yeah, from absolutely. above. Yeah, sure. Th these are not big units and they're connected yeah. with piping. Yeah. yeah, the piping is relatively small. Okay. Um, you know, the piping, if you were to add a skylight or, or some other means for daylight, you right. can certainly route piping or even locate cassette units 
you know, according to wherever those. Yeah, you don't get a good scale with this. That could set you. Yeah, is, it, is it two by yeah, two? It's, it's basically a ceiling top. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I think the yeah, seal on like that image. So yeah. Like, yeah. Sorry, they're not. No, no, no. I'm not. It's no critique. I just that's why I asked the question. Was I, sure. I didn't have a sense of scale. Yeah, and, so. and the outdoor units compared to like a what people so, might know at home. So your 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 while your your split units at home might be two to three feet wide and maybe ten inches, twelve inches wide. Yeah. And, Couple of foot or two tall, or two or three feet tall. These will typically run you two foot by two foot and maybe four foot in height. And you'll it's typically water. Bigger, but yeah, they're a little bigger. Um, and then great. depending on what your capacity requirements are, you can actually pair multiple together. So it's just taking that same box, put it next to it. So similarly on the on the, which you can see on the top left, that's a two two units. So that's probably uh, somewhere between um, 144 tons to maybe. Excuse me. 144 MBH to maybe uh, 230, 240. So you can get a lot at, from a very small footprint, but it does take roof area. So, <coughs> hope that answers your question. It, no, absolutely. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry if I misread the scale. No, yeah, they're, they're not the know. scale. I should. I should well, I'm not a, an expert in looking at these yeah. things. So, yeah. Is, do we have existing equipment up on the floor of the roof? Like, I'm a little concerned about like the structural. The, well, the with, yeah, anything we add to the roof, it would have to be reviewed um, structurally. Uh, you know, a, a VRF unit might weigh a few hundred pounds, um, but I would imagine you probably need to, to have some sort of supplemental support. Uh, the DOAS unit um, will be a couple thousand pounds. That will definitely need some sort of support in some instance. You don't really have major units on the roof right now. Right now, yeah. So just just an aside to perhaps future conversations because on the on the capital plan from the town of Amherst is looking at the Fort River roof, you know, sooner than this any of this would come to reality. So um, I think as our team, you know, particularly our facilities team has discussions about that, we should stay in contact with what that might look like and, and so that we're not spending so you're money not to undo money to carrying up a roof that you just put in. Right, right. Um, and I know nothing about roofs. This may be a moot point based on what our issues are, but I just wanted to talk about roofs and capacity and sure. perhaps the town being asked to spend money on roofs. I just think we should be locked up about what the realities might be in the future. That's all. Uh, moving forward, um, another option we've had success with is chill beams. Um, similarly, uh, you'd be using a DOAS unit. Uh, Ventilation, and treatment of outside air. That outside air would be ducted to your chill beams, um, and they are basically a heating and cooling coil uh, that sits in the ceiling. Um, to put it very simplistically, um, one of the benefits of chill beams is we do have a lot more options visually as far as what we can do. Um, there are chill beams that could be uh, worked into light fixtures, um, or pendant light fixtures. You could have two by two chill beams, two by four, two by six. Um, and their size will vary depending on what you need for a heating and cooling load. Uh, a couple of, of, of benefits. Um, it, it is less noise in a VRF system. Um, there are no fans in the chill beam, whereas a VRF system, if you did do a two by two cassette, the fan is in the actual cassette. Uh, so it, it does generate a little bit more noise um, than needs to be considered. Um, uh, one of the drawbacks. Um, uh, of the chill beam is it does require chill water and hot water, um, and it does introduce an increased complexity for controls. Um, so one of the considerations for chill beams is making sure the space dew point temperature stays above a certain threshold. Um, one of the issues you want to avoid is uh, if your temperatures change very drastically, you can potentially have condensation occurring at the chill beam, which we want to avoid. So a situation if you had a lot of operable windows, we want to monitor uh, whether or not those uh, windows are open um, because that could introduce a lot of untreated outside air into the space and then you could have a condition where your, where your chill beams are condensing. Uh, there's control methods to accommodate that uh, and to account for that, um, but it, it does add a little bit of uh, cost when compared to say a VRF system. Um, sort of summarizing um, as far as our, our five systems, um, uh, <coughs> cool VRF does project um, heat to the building exterior basically through your 
roof. Um, uh, optical systems two and four, which are water cooled BRF geothermal system and chill building geothermal system, respectively. Those have heat rejection to a geothermal well um, out on the site someplace. Um, alternatively, if you use a cooling tower, you locate a cooling tower at system three and five. Those uh, heat gets rejected to your cooling tower. Um, compressors with option one, your air cooled VRF. Um, compressors are located on the roof. Um, and the remainder of the systems, um, excluding system five, systems two, three, and four, and you have heat pumps or source heat pumps someplace in your building. Um, so, consideration there is their proximity to adjacent spaces. Compressors do, te do tend to be your noisiest piece of equipment. Um, so you need some sort of acoustical treatment. Question? Okay. Um, as far as ventilation, they're all being used as a DOAS system. It's all from our rooftop unit, or potentially indoor. Uh, typically, it'd be easier to do it through a rooftop unit. Um, humidity control, uh, our intent would be to use the DOAS unit to pre-treat the outside air and remove moisture from the air so as it, it's introduced into space. You're not doing any latent cooling with your uh, VRF unit for your chill beams. Um, as far as units serving in classrooms with your VRF options, option uh, system options one, two, and three, you do have uh, VRF cassettes or ducted units in your spaces. Uh, for options four and five with chill beams, you obviously have chill beams uh, size and shape you know, can be varied as, as needed. Um, as far as the gym, uh, the gym typically does not lend itself to the use of a VRF system or a chill beam. Uh, it tends to be a very large open space, so in a space like that, we'd be looking to use a single zone heat pump, which is a little bit bigger, with large capacity, and a better handle a space like the gymnasium. Um, so we would not have the DOAS units, so I just want to mention that um, so it's uh, somewhat clear. Uh, as far as supplemental heat um, for VRF, system, the air cooled VRF, you would only consider uh, supplemental heat if there's some sort of comfort cooling application. Uh, if you have a large uh, curtain wall or a large window and, and you intend to have people sit by there, you might want to consider some sort of electric system heat just to um, carry the skin loss. Um, as as hot, hot air rises and cold air falls, you can be draft or something like that, which we want to address. Um, the remainder of the systems, if it was required, we would more than likely consider an electric boiler with the intent not to use fossil fuels. Uh, the geothermal system, you can generally get away from using electric boiler, um, but we don't want to say we wouldn't consider it, but our intent would be to try and avoid it if possible. Okay, that, that's a lot of information. <laughs> I don't think that you're asking this building committee to select things. No, no, I just, I'm just I, sort of... I, I think it's important to get Jim, the facilities director, get his opinion. He may have history with certain systems that he prefers or doesn't prefer. So I think it's important to get a full run of the touch base with him. Yeah, we, we, can, done, so. we can sort of summarize. I, I wasn't intending to have you guys pick a system today. It was more to sort of glaze over uh, some of the options we're looking at and, and why we're looking at them. Um, you know, all of our systems are electric um, as, as we pursue you know, a net zero building and not using fossil fuels. Yes. Uh, whatever. I don't know. We're in the same direction. So yeah. Yeah. I have a question about cost. How much do they scale linearly with the how uh, between one and five they cost? There's huge differences can, or small differences? The the air cooling <coughs> will probably be your cheapest option. Um, I would say your option using geothermal probably is the most expensive. Um, I would I would think one more zero or uh, it varies based on the layout. I would I wouldn't say it's an extra zero, um, but it could be an extra five to ten dollars square foot. So it it, it does add up. Um, I think geothermal wells. Recent experience for me has, has been wells between ten and twelve thousand dollars each. So well, you're talking you're talking about probably million and a half to million dollars. Yeah. For the well, for the, for the well, it could be easily. Half a million to three quarters of a million. Yeah. The, the, the difference between the VRF or the chill beam options is probably five bucks a square foot. So that I think that information would be useful to help. 
We can. I mean, I could. I could give some feedback to to your uh, facility maintenance. Um, as far as our experience with cost, um, but we, we are in cost in that estimate, so I can, I can give you a ballpark. Maybe it's yeah, part of the process we're going through right now is, yeah. is to lay this out so that we can get some feedback from our cost estimator and give you better information. But we want to see that we're going down the right path and we're aligned with your thinking. Right. I don't want to, what, what I'm hoping is if you have had bad experience with the system, you know, if you say, oh my, you know, oh my God, I hate system five, then I, okay. I'll, I'll remove that off the table. You know, maybe we can talk separately and understand why you've had a bad experience. But so in layman's yeah, terms, in layman's terms, yeah. people are going home and telling their <laughs> family, you know what we learned today that it looks like we're going to be doing a system that doesn't have fossil fuel. Is that correct? Correct. That it probably has electric boilers. Is that correct? Potentially, depending on but what system. Maybe. Not necessarily. Maybe. Maybe geothermal. Maybe geothermal. Definitely photovoltaics. Yes. You would need photovoltaics offset your electric uses if you're trying to net zero. Net zero. Yeah. The, the more efficient system we can have, the, the reduced number of photovoltaics you need. Okay. So, so as you're um, also putting together the different costs, I, I, I would really like to see um, differences between these maintenance. So not only the Cost of maintenance, but how difficult is it to maintain? What are the pitfalls? Where you know sure. where are we? Well, I did. Yeah, I right. Yeah, a lifetime. Yes, and you know, over over time, that would be that would be helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. I, well, I can let you know as far as maintenance. Your chill beams will probably have a lower maintenance than your VRF systems. Your VRF systems, you have a lot more equipment spaced out through your building, so there's a lot more points of failure potentially. Um, and a lot of your VRF units do have a, a, a filter associated with them. They have to be washed for God. One feedback we've gotten from a couple of districts is that the systems like the chill beams, uh, their maintenance personnel and staff could do that directly, but they were <coughs> outsourced in VRF. That was more of a specialized. It is, you're right. There is a the higher level of complexity with chill beams. Um, so it, what, what might be fair to, to interject at this point is all of these systems are very different than what what's in anything yes. in, in yes. any of the schools. Absolutely. And I, I would venture to say anything that in any town owned property at the moment. Um, in and these in, in Amherst. Amherst. Yeah, yeah that, for us as a community. Your, your facilities folks need to be comfortable with this. Right. We would want to have had experiences elsewhere. Right. I, I don't want to put anything forth about Jim's experience one way or the other. Sure. Right. Yes. I want to follow up. I agree with um, I read various comments and you know it's probably too early but it would be helpful to see a couple things in this matrix um, so one is the cost piece that was mentioned but one is also the energy savings the proposed energy savings and I know it's hard to do energy modeling until we're a little further along but I think having a sense of what the install cost is the maintenance piece but also uh, how quickly you'd make the money back based on the energy savings that would be realized and the other comment I had is are we thinking about these, and I may have missed this, I apologize, but these systems, regardless of whether it's new construction, renovate, like, is it, is, are these systems what, what we'd consider regardless of any of the options, or this is particular for one option? Uh, well, right, right now, if, if you, one of the issues, the reason we're proposing certain systems is because of a uh, limitation with the existing structure. Okay. So if you were to, say, pursue a conventional VAB system, uh, that has a larger rooftop unit um, that could be fed off your existing boiler. Um, but one of the issues you'll run into is running ductwork through your existing space. Right. So that becomes an issue. Um, it's not to say that it's impossible, but it does pose a lot of unique challenges that have to be addressed. So it's a one-story building. It's conceivable that you could run ductwork on the roof. You could, and theoretically. There are a lot. There would be a lot of penetrations and a lot of potential for a leak at one of those penetrations. So what, just to make sure I'm understanding your answer, so regardless of whether we're talking about renovation or new construction, these five systems were chosen because they could work in either model. Correct. Okay. So make sure. We could potentially use the existing boiler, right. um, but any a situation where you use a portion of the existing building and then have an addition, that addition would have to follow the net zero approach. That's really helpful. Thank you. I, at this point, need to, to, to call a quick time. We're about to lose quorum. I think we continue to can continue to discuss things once we lose quorum. But 
I would like us to vote quickly on an invoice we have for our new meeting minute taker so she does not have to wait uh, another <laughs> another round of, of, of meetings. I'm just going to quickly pass some of these in each direction and ask our consultants to, to be patient with us as we do a little bit of housekeeping business. Um, these are the minutes for, and I apologize for not being able to get these out ahead of the meeting. Um, uh, this is for uh, recording of last meeting, which is the first one uh, with Laura. Um, and this is, is in the same range as some of the ones we had before. Um, and, and Laura was hoping that she may get a bit more efficient. Um, but I did go back and look at the context, and, and this is in the, in the general ballpark. So I'm sure we'll go out for a while. People have questions on the invoice. Can I get a motion to approve it? I will stop from the minute. Uh, from the invoice. invoice. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Allison can go. <laughs> <laughs> Question. Yes. About, um, so we I think Well, we probably should technically adjourn. Um, I'm going to wonder whether we keep the camera on. Is there yes. any harm in that? No. Um, I don't think so. Uh, but let people continue to ask questions. We just can't make a decision to pass this point. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be asking for any no. direction. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So we have to move. Oh, yes, we have to. We actually have to. I need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All favor? We're now voting. Oh. I think you voted with your feet. She voted with her feet. She voted with her feet. Yeah. She voted with her feet. Well, uh, that was a little sloppy parliamentary procedure on my part. I apologize. The intent was clear. Oh, yeah. Um, question. Yeah, just a question about could you speak to what assets, if, if any, there are in the existing mechanical system? Uh, the existing boiler is I think, 8 to 10 years old, which is pretty um, relatively new, um, as is within its useful life. I think. And it's a gas-fired? I believe it's a gas-fired boiler, yeah. But you, you could conceivably use that for the chill beam options. Most buildings with chill beams, or many right. buildings with chill beams, do in fact use the gas boiler. And is there any parts of the distribution system that are? I think for the most part, you'd probably cut it back pretty significantly. Yeah, you have unit ventilators, which we would like to yeah. yeah. I would get rid want to get rid of those. Yes, please. <laughs> hey, <Yeah. peace> out. <laughs> what I would add to that is I put this, knowing that Jim would not be able to come tonight um, and, and in his role, um, I asked him what whether he thought there were any, from his perspective, uh, any systems that, that beyond the boilers could be salvaged. And he certainly didn't see anything in the distribution systems from his perspective. He thinks they've all passed their useful life. That goes for not just the mechanical system, but also the plumbing, the slab, and all, and all that sort of stuff. So we should assume a lot of that, you know, even in a renovation model, is going right. to be new. That's been our thinking as well. Other questions? Yeah, I can public can comment, Phil? So. Well, we're adjourned. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sort of. Why not? I'm already in trouble, so. Well, I'm, I'm Chris Riddle. I'm a, a, an ex uh, associated with that man across the hall here. He's the um, one we blame for why it's so hot in here. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is AC in the building. I, I don't know why it didn't work. Well, it's probably been turned off here. Or it's did October. They switch, to, switch to heating already. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. Awesome. Um, I, 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 my feeling is that Jonathan and I have talked about this in the past, that, uh, that looking at the Fort River building, uh, a building with essentially an uninsulated exterior wall, single glazing, um, uninsulated slab, um, uh, a lot of floor plan changes, some structural changes, uh, complete scrapping of the HVAC system. Is it your opinion as the architect that it's going to save money to renovate to you? Will it cost more per square foot or less per square foot to renovate that building? Cost more than what? A new than, than, new, than new construction. Uh, don't forget also you have to consider phasing. Construction Pardon? phasing. Construction phasing in the renovation project okay. will be will be complicated and it will add to the duration of construction. So my gut tells me it will be less expensive to build new. We'll find that out. You're going to give us that. I, I, have, to, I have to support that gut mm -hmm. feeling with more facts and figures. And the other thing, well, I guess that's, that is my basic question. And I, I really feel that we need to get rid of these buildings, both this one and Wildwood. 
I think that there'll be a compromise forever. So, and I don't think it's going to save any money to try to keep them. My, my opinion. I'm, what am I? What do I know? I'm not, I'm not involved in this project. But I, would, I would want this body, body to be very careful about this. It's very easy for new con for construction to be cheaper than renovation if you're doing very substantial renovations and have to go a long ways. Correct. Well, I should probably reiterate that in the end, it's not going to be this body that picks the preferred option. I'm sorry. I should probably reiterate that we as a body, as, as, as a committee, don't actually get to pick a, a, a preferred option. We, we have to explore multiple options as, as we've charged them, right. um, and, and we have to come up with pros and cons. Um, but ultimately, hopefully folks will look at that, and, and some of this should become self-evident. Okay. There we go. Can I question about the energy efficiency? I've seen some buildings that they put a second skin and exterior skin. Um, is there solar panels, glass? Um, is there something that can be? Do you have experience doing that? Is there something that can be done to the existing building to put a second skin? Yes, you have to be very careful doing that because if you're insulating from the outside, where that insulation occurs, you could actually create a condensation problem in the exterior skin. But um, some of the sounds. Some of the ones I've seen even is just glass. Passive, passive yeah, just, solar. Yeah, just passive solar. I've seen uh, the shading, I saw it in neon, I saw many buildings that they had to either shading or even solar, uh, transparent yeah, solar panels. Double wall. We've seen yeah. that we're, we're done with taller buildings and office buildings is a good example. Uh, uh, architect and Peter Busby did that with the Dallas building in Vancouver where they took an existing kind of ugly uh, office building and they just put a second glass box around the whole thing. Uh, that's probably not the low cost option. <laughs> uh, it is very elegant uh, and, and then they use that interstitial space for moving air and uh, opening and closing things to control the environment inside. Uh, you, you, you do anything. I've, I've, seen about, I've seen factories that they put solar, like the, these solar panels that are uh, glass. Uh, so the efficiency is <coughs> that they most solar panels, but you can have even light going through. Uh, yeah, I mean, there certainly are um, are different sorts of glazing systems that can yeah. also generate solar. And you know, the whole thing is how much of the light are you going to capture versus pass through? Yeah, uh, yeah I think uh, all those I, things start to no, get I, 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 I was wondering yeah. because I've seen it in, house, in the Netherlands with houses, and so I don't. We have a lot of problems in yeah, the Fort River uh, <laughs> building, uh, and one of which is the footprint of the building. Yeah, so the geometry of the building is problematic. So by spending a lot of money on the exterior skin or the roof, it doesn't really address that. Um, we're trying to create a, a 21st, 22nd century school, uh, making sure that there's adequate daylight everywhere and so on. But I, I think that's the goal. Uh, we're going to do the best that we can with the low end of the spectrum, um, but at some point, it's just not cost effective to do it. Other, other questions for folks tonight? It's just following up on that though, whether it's the double wall or, I mean, do you envision in the, the cost estimating, I mean, this gets into your architectural report, right. like, would we try to address the R values of Absolutely. the, and, and there's Absolutely. ways to do that that are, Yes, there's multiple ways to do that, but yes, that's that will be part of the charge, is to bring the building up to code, and that means energy code as well. So that means insulation value, that means window, thermal paint, all that sort of stuff. From another perspective, your single-story building has a huge roof, right? Yeah. And we can yeah, the area of wall to roof is, is really yeah. almost distorted. Right. If we're replacing yeah. the windows and fixing the roof, then what's left isn't that <laughs> 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 so, um I'd just be curious, and I think I've just sent by an email, but I don't know if you're all on it. Wednesday nights almost, I can almost never make it, so I apologize that my attendance hasn't been as good as I'd like. Um, but I do think the phasing that you mentioned is something that I know Diane and I am everyone to be concerned about, but on a practical operational level um, for future meetings. Um, there's, but there's a cost to it, but there's you know the financial cost, but there's also the where do we put kids, you know? Oh, uh, absolutely. And so, uh, I don't know when that process gets rolling or where that gets integrated. I don't have an opinion on it, but I just think it's something that certainly, as we go down roads, we're gonna get a lot of questions about that. We will. Uh, we will analyze the phasing 
and the uh, duration of construction will be part of that cost. And it, it, it's, it, you'll see the difference. Thank you. So thinking forward to our next meeting, um, if we're done kind of asking questions about tonight's presentation, um, my, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but my guess is you would like us to begin to think about how to narrow that matrix yes. down into something that, that you're refining more deeply, but fewer of them. Correct. Um, and, and so... Six would be nice. Six would be nice, yes. <laughs> if you can. Okay. Eight. We will, we will be thinking about thinking about that. Okay. So we try to meet before it, so, so we try to meet next week so that we can, because if, if, if we're going to be narrowing down, I don't know if we, you need to be here or not. Well, I think they need, I think there was some, there was some potential updating um, that we may want to happen ahead of that. Um, and I think it might be worth um, having them formally present the full matrix, even not in the same depth, but so that we're all reminded of what they were and what, what some of the basic uh, relationships were. Um, but, and then have, it, have that discussion and hopefully we can make a narrowing in one, one meeting, next meeting. But I, I'd have to look at the, the overall calendar. I, I haven't thought about it in that kind of context yet. But does that, does that work I'm for you? As we've, um, we have new information coming in, we're potentially looking at other options than the five that we've presented so far. Right. Um, I'm concerned we may need to have more time in our schedule to be able to have those options narrowed and, and then go back and refine them. I only okay. see that as the process because there are comments that are open right now that we still need to get into. Um, and That's close. true. We didn't, we didn't get to a fair amount tonight. Well, I guess what I would say is if you could think about how you want to present and uh, list for us things we might need to decide next week, or next, next week, the next meeting, sure. uh, and get that to us a couple days ahead, that would be helpful. Okay, we could do that. And then I think we would like to look at the schedule again. Yes. And remember, we had identified certain uh, milestones or certain decisions yep. in the forthcoming meeting, and it's maybe, we may need to adjust that. And we had been, uh, we have this potential, or not potential, we have the scheduled joint meeting with the school committee coming up in November. At about the same time, we were also thinking we were going to have a community outreach. And so we may want to look at that calendar again, make sure that's still realistic. When we do present, I want it to be a good presentation. So let us take a cut at the calendar, and then we can forward that to you okay. as soon as we have some. I think right. something that would be it would be helpful for me and I think other people as we do try to do more community outreach and there's some different ideas about how to go about doing that, but it's at what level do we want to get input? I mean, I gave you guys some input on a very specific level. I don't know if that's too deep a level. Are we talking at, we need to, at a higher level? Do we? Uh, it seems to me we don't really have um, definite answers on our space summary, which of course everything Correct. falls from. I, I do you think we want to close out our space summary. Yeah. Um, that's an important goal here because we're now building these options off of space summary. Now, there was a big piece that was brought into play, but even with the smaller pieces in the special education area particularly, it would help to have clarification from the district as to what our goals are there so that we're, we're more hitting them in these, in these detailed plans that we're showing and that we're not running into questions, you know, two months from now. Well, why is that we're not there? Uh, we don't want to we don't want the details to be throwing us off. So, is there is there someone who can review the special education space for the district? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. we have two special education administrators who yes. would that, be the logical be people. They're in charge of specialized. I mean, particularly the specialized program spaces, which um, I do have concerns about where they are. Not about the size or anything, but they're located in a way where I think uh, when we get audited by the state, they would say. These are not integrated in the school, right? Um, not and so, you know, and that's that's probably not as large a fix as, as you know other things that may come up. But they would be the logical people to take a look and um, offer feedback on that. And we certainly can figure well, out a way for. I can say the therapeutic space that I mentioned before is listed in that first two-page document. I found it in there. They're listed as reflection rooms. Well, we have reflection rooms in the plan. They're like right, but it's a not. reduction from what's in that original list. There's three in each plan. Right, and the, the original sheet. And it gets five. Oh, and then there's two typically in the. Um, okay, there may be two missing in some of the plans. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, 
we will get them in there. They're just small. They are small, but they're, they're highly important. utilized, yeah. And, <laughs> so with your permission, what we'd like to do is contact Michael and about getting together with the uh, special ed folks. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. I had sort of initiated, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, because directed the follow-up. Okay. Um, I had initiated a meeting with um, Joanne Smith and Faye Brady and Nancy um, Stewart. Stewart. And so I don't know if it would make sense to try to just roll that in um, cool. with you guys. I mean, I was, I think that would be even better than me just trying to translate. <laughs> yeah, because I had, I had these very concerns, like it just didn't seem like we were all m met up yet on that. So the, e the scheduling emails just went out today. <coughs> so maybe we can integrate those two. Can I ask a clarifying question this time? I'm conscious of the up, but were you looking to like get written feedback from them? Were you looking to like Skype in so that you could talk through the plans with them? I don't know what the mechanism that you were looking for for communication. We would like to meet. Okay, you would come up. Okay. And, and we would come up, yes. And we would like to have a discussion about what the district's goals are mm -hmm. for special ed. Yeah. So I think um, Thank you. if the committee wants, I can facilitate. I likely wouldn't attend that meeting and trust those folks, but um, the, the time, and I think including Nancy Stewart, who is the Special Ed Parent Advisory Council President, would be uh, another really good person to have in that meeting. Okay. She works very closely with our student service. Okay. And I, don't, I want to come back to Maria's question about um, public input. Um, I think you're almost there. <coughs> what I would like to have is the options picked from that matrix so that this committee feels comfortable with six, those six options, let's say. And then we can start discussing this with members of the public and say, we're looking at six options. And here are the six options. And this is what well, we started with a much broader list than we narrowed it down, and here's why. Uh, I, I don't think you need to present 30 options. I think you need to narrow it down and, and start getting some questions. So that hopefully, while we're going to present a group of options, the school committee might be slightly narrower than six. It might be. Some of them might be filtered out by it might be. what we learn yeah. or not. Uh, yeah. So I have a couple of comments regarding the rooms. I think we were talking the other day about flexibility, and I think you brought it up. Staffing and programs change and requirements change throughout the years. So I don't know if we need to go a one by one comparison of what is now to what it has to be built and maybe have rooms that have some flexibility and they can be repurposed because we are building for many years to come and probably you didn't have the same rooms 10 years ago than the ones that you're having now or the personnel that you have. I think we have to be careful of having one to one exactly the same and we have to have some flexibility and the spaces has to be some set flexibility. Um, because if not in five years from now we're gonna say, oh yeah, I don't fit because I'm exactly too tight uh, for the spaces. Um, the other thing is there was talked at some point that one of the programs might be moving. So I think that the district is gonna have to clarify uh, whether that because also that has the impact on the square footage. Yeah, I think that'll become more clear also in a similar timeline as the school size, probably sometime in November. Okay, so then that also has to be the program. In advocating for the therapeutic space, I can say based on the experiences that I've had, those spaces are going to become more <coughs> necessary than less necessary. Okay, so I wanted to get go back to some of the comments I made and it might sure. concern of just overall total square footage and this being, you know, a lot of square feet. Um, and are there ways that we can have that flexibility but also the multi-purpose rooms and see if we can bring that down? I, I, know, I don't know. I, I know that we have to decide that as part of the space, and not just the number of rooms, but <coughs> um, how big well, everything is. Well, let's talk about the ends of the spectrum of options. At one end, we have a new building that, let's say, meets MSBA guidelines exactly because you're going to go for MSBA funding and you want to make sure that you play by their rules. That's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is you don't really care about MSBA funding. You want to do this thing as cost effectively as possible, and we're going to work within the footprint of the existing building because there's enough square footage in the existing building to accommodate your program. 
you're going to compromise some things, but it's not ideal, but it's the least expensive way to go. And you can extend the useful life of that building X number of years, and we'll try to plug in that X number of years. So that's the other end of the spectrum. It's a different. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking, but even in, you know, with part, with an addition, demolition, renovation, just to, you know, uh, uh, the, the current footprint of the building is extremely problematic. And I right. think that confining ourselves to the current footprint is probably a mistake. Um, um, but as we do demolition and addition, even so, I don't think we, you know, do we need to end up still at 80 plus thousand square feet? Yeah, the, the question is about the target, the program. So it almost, from my perspective, it doesn't matter the construction strategy, whether it's new or renovation, because you're trying to yeah. get to this target. And so, I mean, if you see efficiencies in the, the room list, um, and some of those we've discussed, I mean, we're, we're going with the smaller media center, which we're trying to verify out and prove out. Um, the gym, we've got the big gym, and there's some talk about maybe we should have a smaller gym, and that let's say that's open, but right now we're working with the big one. And then in special education, we've talked about Parker Farm uses the RTI rooms as, as in a way to fit into that building, but it also allows some multi-use of some special education space so that not every staff member necessarily has their own room, but they're able to um, provide their services efficiently uh, with perhaps less space. And so we didn't model around that yet, and maybe that's something that comes out of this follow-up or not, I don't know. Um, but if you see other opportunities for... Um, so what you're saying is, regardless of the option, try to follow the MSBA guidelines. No, no, no I'm no. saying... I'm saying sh she's asking, is there a way to reduce the proposed square footage, our, our room list, uh, which it exceeds MSBA guidelines by quite a bit right now. Well, okay. So I think one example I think is the orchestra and the band. Those get used one and a half days a week. So how, how much, how cost effective is it to have two separate rooms and one's over 1,000 square feet for rooms that get used only one and a half day a week and they be labeled multi-purpose three and a thinking of the other three days of the week, three and a half days of the week they get used for other parts and satisfy part of the program in other ways. Knowing that it's a fixed day that you have but the orchestra is a fixed day. Despite I'm actually getting. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Chessie. Oh, please. Despite how infrequently they're used, those I understand those two staff members come at the same time. So yeah, but no, I uh, uh, no, but they come at the same time. But they can be used the other three days of the week, mm -hmm. three and a half days. They can be purposed for some other purpose because it's fixed. So it can be conference space three and a half, three and a half days of the week. Something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm getting really uncomfortable that we're not at quorum and we're not at yes, this level that, of detail. That's okay. exactly what I was so talking no about. Okay, but I'm sorry. just saying, just no. We, I, I think okay, we, these are important things, and I think it's important for everybody here and, and chime in on them. Um, and so, not to cut things off. I'm going to cut things off. Okay, <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.